The Capital Connection is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. David Gustina is the producer of The Capital Connection. Support comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Shartok. Joining us this week, and am I happy about that? Because he is one of my best buddies. Don't tell anybody I said so. New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. Welcome back, Tom. Nice to be back and to be in studio. Are you experiencing any major life changes as a result of our progress on the COVID? Wow, life changes? That's an interesting way to put the question. I think, like everybody, you tend to value precious moments more, family and friends more. I actually, as opposed to most people, lost weight during COVID. As opposed yeah, you're to looking good. I you're feel good. good. Yeah, yeah no, I feel good. good. So I'm hoping maybe my better dietary habits will hold up. But I do think that you know it was a rough two years. I got older. We all got older, and and I think I think I think you understand how precious and vulnerable life is. So I don't I don't know if that's life changing, but I try to perhaps value every moment a little more than I did before. Are our conversations yours and mine? different from yours in the New York Times, because I notice that we have a really big story. I don't absolutely fault you for this, but instead of running to Chautauk, you often give it to the New York Times first. Well, you know, that doesn't seem right to me. I mean, look, let's be honest. The <laughs> the New York Times often doesn't take our stuff, so <laughs> we're very glad they were interested in this story. But there's no doubt that Alan Shartok, to us, is the the voice of, of reason and good sense and perspective, and that's why I'm always honored to be on your show. And, Alan, I will say mm. why I like being in studio is when, we, when I do it from the office on the phone, all I do is look at your body bobblehead mm-hmm. and yeah. it is so much better to see you in the flesh and to your listeners who through COVID perhaps have not run into you you're alive and well and strong and God bless you you never say something like that to somebody who grew up Jewish on the west side of Manhattan like a Kenahara yeah it's a Kenahara ah, <laughs> poo 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 come on now let's let's come on <laughs> <laughs> okay so anyway you know, I noticed some people will say that, you know, you're very stick to as opposed to funny. But you're a very funny man. Did your mother and father appreciate your humor? <laughs> my mother certainly did not. My mother was a, uh, my mother Adelaide, who, uh, sad to say, has been gone over 30 years. She 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 thought I was a bit uh, tough to handle. It made my brother look much better because he was a little more calm. I was known as being rather rambunctious and one who would talk back. Mm. You know, so I would say, actually, to give you an honest reflection on that question, my mother, more than anybody, I think is the one who grounded me. You know, people sometimes mm. say, you, you seem like you got, you know, your head screwed on right, you don't have a swelled head, anything like that. Well, hopefully I don't. A lot of that's you my don't, mother. I can assure everybody. Well, but, my, but that's my, my mother would never, uh, you know, even, remember, Alan, I, I was first elected when I was 18, right? I was on the front page of Newsday, winning the Board of Education, 1972, first 18 year old uh, elected to anything in the state. What made you want to do that? Oh, you know, the war in Vietnam, all the social movements going on Mm -hmm. at that time, the, 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 the desire to be engaged in changing the world, Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, all the above, uh, very much counter to my conservative Roman Catholic Republican upbringing. But, you know, my mother made clear to me, you're, you're still no better than anybody else. And just because you're elected to something, don't don't think you're but don't, don't get a swelled head. So to this day, if if people go, you know, sometimes you get introduced to something and people go overboard and saying nice things. I still have my mother whispering in my ear, you're no better than anybody else mm. and don't let this go to your head. And I think that was a an important lesson. My father didn't tolerate too much nonsense either, but my mother was more the enforcer of control yourself, behave yourself. What did your father do? My father was a it, what he he was a he went to World War II, uh, a veteran came back and he 
was hired as a cable splicer's helper for the New York Telephone Company. Really? And uh, and then he married my mom, and then he, he worked. He was a lineman for the phone company. He was uh, a shop steward for the communication workers, so he was wow. active in the union. Towards the end of his career, he became a foreman, uh, so slight promotion. But he was a working guy, worked with his hands, worked in manholes, worked at telephone work shifts. Up early in the morning, you know, w w people in the neighborhood always come. To, we, we always ate dinner like no later than 5 o'clock because my father was out 5 in the morning. So we were like, the, the, we were eating dinner early for when he when he came back. But Alan, he, he was a high school graduate and there was no doubt that in terms of his opportunities, they were severely limited by only being a high school graduate. And that was, I think, one of the reasons why his greatest goal in life was to make sure that... I would go and my brother would go to college because he saw the opportunities that were not open to him as a high school graduate and he wanted to make sure we had those greater opportunities and and I give him uh, the credit for that again working class guy but scrimped and saved I'm embarrassed to say because I know how tough the issue of college tuition is today uh, my 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 parents paid for my tuition at Hofstra you know at a private university back then it was so important to them. I mean, I paid for books and miscellaneous, but but they wanted to make sure that I would get that college degree. My only disappointment to him was that I, did, I didn't want to be a lawyer. That's That was what he wanted from me, but uh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. And when did you become friends with our mutual friend, Norman Adler? Wow. Well, Norman, remember, was uh, uh, the executive, well, what was his title? The political director, I guess, for DC 37. That's right. Uh, asked me that great union representing city workers. So when I was running in uh, 1986, the first time for state assembly, Norman interviewed me for an endorsement. And you know Norman's tough customer, right? You know he, he grills you. I know. You know. I mean, Nor you know, yeah. to those who don't know Norman, he's you know he's he's no he's no walk in the park. I love you, Norman. Uh, well, probably the greatest, uh, one of the greatest political minds in New York. No question about it. And and so when he decided to endorse me. Again, being Norman, he went all in. So they had phone banks going for me, you know, in the city. And then, of course, you remember, Mel Miller became speaker, right? right Stanley yeah. Feig didn't run again. So, so the year I ran for assembly was Stanley Feig's last year. And uh, Tony Genovese was the head of uh, DAC, another legend. Uh, You're making me cry. Yeah, all, all these, these are great giants. Yeah. And when Mel became speaker, and, and keep in mind, so I was from Nassau, so Jerry Kremer was running, and I was, as a Nassau person, loyal to Jerry, a Nassau guy. But Mel became speaker, and Mel brought uh, Norman in as, as secretary. And so... Put another way, Norman was sort of running things. Yeah. And so here I was, this freshman, trying to figure out my way in Albany in the assembly. And I think as I made... Well, I don't know if I ever mentioned to you, I wasn't thrilled my first year here in this town. As an assemblyman. As an assemblyman. I found it very difficult to navigate the process I came out of a corporate environment. I had been working at AT&T. And, uh, you know, there was a policy manual on the shelf. If you had a question, you, you got a straight answer. You come here, it's like the Wild West, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So Norman was like the go-to person if I needed something. And, and he would really, first of all, be helpful, but also try to, you know, keep me focused and keep me calm. And he, he really helped me a great time. I remember the first budget, I had some local projects I wanted to get funded, and I was told there wasn't money for it, you know, typical story. And I remember uh, the night that the budget was being done, Norman came over to me with a little card and said, here's the additions we were able to do for you for your district. Really? You know, so he always looked out for me. And, and, and then when, I, when I've done other campaigns, he's always been an unofficial advisor. 2001, when I had an unsuccessful campaign for county executive in Nassau, Norman actually was, you know, one of the one of the consultants that I used, and you know, with him, it's he's a consummate professional, as you know, political strategist extraordinaire, but a dear friend. So whether it's just talking to me as a friend or or a professional relationship, Norman always tells me straight, and I can have confidence. And by the way, I'll tell you this: not, not to spend the whole show on Norman, but you know, there was a time in two thousand and one where he wanted me to do something because he felt if I didn't do it, I was, you know, it was going to be a problem, and I I wouldn't do it, and so. The only way I could deal with because he was so darn persistent is I just I just stopped returning his phone because I wouldn't talk to him for like three days. And when I finally talked to him again, he says, that means you're not going to do it. I said, I'm not going to do it. I didn't want to have you keep haranguing me. In retrospect, had I done what he had said, outcome might have been different. You know, 9-11 made it a problem in 2001 anyway, but he is a wise and gifted political analyst and a dear friend. And 
of course, you and he share that history yeah, of Madame Beerbaum French and, and French class. Yes. Yeah, she told us that she needed our help. And believe me, I was going to get through. I wasn't so sure about Norman <laughs> <laughs> in that class. But we did what she wanted and gave a French soiree, and we've been looking for her ever since. A- Alan, we have put the word out on this show many we times, have. and we've yet, we've yet to hear from the, the Beerbaum Foundation Network or Foundation or wherever. Yeah, so. we, you know, it's just as if she disappeared. I suppose I have to make some news with you. You made news this week with your audit on how the Department of Health managed the pandemic in nursing homes. So the question then becomes, was that a shot at Andrew? No. Look, we call it like we see it with our audits. And keep in mind, the audits are done by auditors, right? Auditors are civil service people. They are hired through a merit system. They are not political people. I don't know if they're Republicans or Democrats. You can't tell the auditors what to do. They do it. We had an audit underway on nursing homes. We've done nurse, nursing home audits in the past, and nothing not, not related to the pandemic, and we found deficiencies in oversight. So we had started an audit on nursing homes, particularly looking at infection control. But in the context of COVID, you know, what really, I think, was appropriate for us to take a deeper dive specific to what was happening with how COVID was handling, and certainly hearing the concerns from so many of the families who lost loved ones to really look at the question of not only infection control and prevention, but also reporting of numbers and accuracy of data. So this report went on for for a number of months, and, um, you know, what we put out uh, confirmed, I think, what a lot of folks already knew, and certainly what our great Attorney General Tish James had reported, is that there was an underreporting of nursing home deaths, what I think is is troubling uh, in, in the audit is that it was clear that while there was inaccuracies in the reporting at the at the early end, they did figure it out, but that information, the accurate information, still didn't get out to the public, and so that really you know spoke to the reality that beyond the Department of Health, those at the executive level will say in the governor's office got got to call it as it is in terms of the public communication of numbers. We're not giving the accurate numbers, uh, and 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 yet the folks of the Department of Health, you know, they they know the reality, but that information didn't get out to the public. <laughs> so so, I, so I, that's I, that, that's just, that's just a, a confirmation of what I think a lot of folks know, which is that data was manipulated to make New York look better than it was by the governor at the time, Andrew Cuomo. Yes. Okay. Have you heard from Cuomo since you've put this? No, note? but I haven't heard from him in a long time. You know, <laughs> either way. <laughs> But, but, Alan, the other piece of the audit, not, not to lose sight of this, is to really look at ways in which Department of Health moving forward, you know, we hope we're past COVID, but who knows what the next public yes, health sir. emergency will be, how are we investing in public health? Mm-hmm. And, and the audit really speaks to what has been an underinvestment, the need for there to be greater workforce training, uh, particularly at the nursing home level the need to collect accurate data, the need to have the right data systems. We did comparisons with how other states handle this and manage this, and New York's not doing as well. And and, and that's gonna mean more resources, more sense of pride, not just, not just being more honest and direct, but it's also, you know, part of the problem was that they, they didn't have the handle on the information they should have had because we had inadequate data systems, data collection, inadequate contact with the nursing homes in the field. And again, some of that is resource-driven, training-driven, but we, we, we better do a better uh, job of investing in our public health system. Biden's proposed more money f- in this area. Uh, I hope I hope if we need if we can't do it on our own in New York, let's hope the feds help us out. As my dissertation advisor, the wonderful Dr. Padilla used to say to me, Shartak, you better, you just better. So the question then becomes, when you say something like this, that we were we really weren't doing it right, do you expect to see some change and some results? Well, I hope so. You know, when we've done some prior audits, just you know, sticking with the nursing home issue where the Department of Health seemed to just be looking at the minimum, you know, in terms of, of, of standards and compliance. And when you had some uh, some of the infractions where they could level a fine or in some way, you know, sanction a nursing home, they, they were not overly uh, aggressive or appropriately aggressive in that. And so we've seen instances in the past where when we call them out, they said they would do a corrective action plan, but they don't really follow through on that. My hope in this case, Alan, is that you know, we have a relatively new administration still with Governor Hochul. 
I would hope that in a new health commissioner that they do not feel encumbered by the past, encumbered by having to be defensive of the past. Uh, this audit should be an opportunity, as all audits are meant mm. to be when they're, when, they, when they're coming up with new recommendations and having certain criticisms, an opportunity to make things to do better, just as, as your professor said. So, you know, the challenge we always have with our audits is that we, we don't, we're not an enforcement agency. You know, people say, well, well, you recommended it. How come they're not doing it? Well, because we don't have the power, the legal power, statutory power uh, to compel compliance. Mm -hmm. So we hope sunlight, conversations like this. Uh, there's been a lot of coverage on this audit. I'm hoping that they won't just circle the wagons. Instead, they'll say, all right, you know, in, in the calmness of a new day, let's figure out how we can do better. I still don't understand why you gave this story to the New York Times before you gave it to us. Well, I just don't get that. But, but I'm having a thoughtful conversation with you. They, they're not getting that, you know. They, yeah. just get a, you know. they just get something in writing. You're getting a face-to-face -face and a thoughtful well, conversation. But that's, but, quali that's a qualitatively better interaction than sending them a press release. Okay, all right. The Russians have invaded Ukraine. You have a lot of money to invest. Know what I mean? So you have to decide whether there's anything that New York State is funding that has, you know, Russian written all over. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a question. It's, it's a question, and it's heartbreaking when we look at what's going on there. Uh, and, you know, the implications long term for what had we thought had been a continuing globalized community and economy uh, seems to be shattered. I don't know if it'll ever go back to the way it was. I do think that uh, what it means, to your point, is that any investments we have tied to the Russian economy are risky investments. It's not a stable regi regime. So uh, are you pulling them? Yeah. So the short answer is yes. So keep in mind, Russia, um, probably not a newsflash, not exactly a place where you make a lot of money. I mean, their economy is right. you know, based on you know, what, what it, uh, they, uh, they keep quoting McCain. It's a, a gas station posing as a, as a nation. So our our direct yeah. holdings with Russia were about 110 million. So out of you know 260 billion dollar pension fund, uh, minor uh, exposure. So we 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 obviously are not doing any new investments, and I've directed the staff to restrict and and ultimately divest those holdings. So it it it'll have really no impact uh, in terms of of our bottom line. Uh, as I said, it's not a place where we make a lot of money anyway, and we don't have much there. Uh, but I think the symbolism of New York State being one of the first pension funds to pull out, as others are doing, is key. We have to show solidarity with the Ukrainian people. I think that's what New Yorkers want. But, Alan, the, the more complex part of that question is those companies uh, that are big names like Pepsi and sure. McDonald's where we have big investments and they have had a presence in Russia. So we took the additional step of, of contacting those big name corporations where we do have significant holdings and say, this hey. is a risky proposition. What are you, what are you doing to, to de-risk and get out of there? And I'm very pleased that what we've been seeing with those big names, you saw it with McDonald's, they're, they're, they're suspending and pulling out. So I, th I think, you know, w it was an important symbolism to sell the, the Russian holdings that we have. By the way, it's not been easy to sell that stuff because nobody wants it. But anyway, that's another question. And it's already gone down in value from when we first assessed the value because of what's happening to the Russian ruble. But more important than that really has been... Uh, the leverage that we as a shareholder placed on on the big companies to say get out of Russia. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the governor's race for a moment. You have Governor Hochul who is there right now. Most of the Democrats that I have heard from or about have been um, endorsing her and yet I talked to Tom Swazi recently. Yeah, he's not endorsing her. No, he's running <laughs> against her. He's running against her. Does he have a shot? Look, I know better than anybody, you never count out Tom Swasey. And don't count out Jermani Williams, by the way. Jermani Williams has a very strong following uh, among uh, pro progressive uh, Democrats, particularly down in the city, and did very well when he ran for lieutenant governor. But, I, you know, my sense of the dynamic, and I, I've been wrong, but I'm usually right, Kathy Hochul's been off to a great start. Uh, she moved into, as she was expected, the lieutenant governor's job is to just see whether or not the governor is around, you know, at every day. And, and the governor wasn't around. She fulfilled her responsibility to become governor. First woman governor, a bit of history there. She's smart. She knows government. She was a local elected official. She was a member of Congress. She served at the state level. She's put together a smart team. 
Uh, I think people like her because she's a likable person. Uh, she's got the advantage of a lot of money right now because the economy's gotten better and we have a lot of money from Washington and the tax increases have brought more money in. I think also she's had a cooperative relationship with the legislature, more so than others have had in the past. I think she's in a strong position, and, and I, I, she also raised a lot of money. So, so I think she's by far the favorite, but we we know the favorites don't always win, so she can't take this race for granted. I don't think she is. So now we have Lee Zeldin. He's the Republican. He's running. Fellow Con- Long Islander. Con- Congressman. Mm-hmm. A fellow what? Long, Long Islander. Long Islander. Yep. Indeed. What the hell could they be thinking on the Republican side? Let's put it that way. I mean, he's not exactly what you'd call a sterling candidate. Well, I mean, look, let me say, I know Lee. Trump told him to do it. <laughs> well, it's, right, maybe. <laughs> I know Lee from Long Island, he, and he was, a, he was a, you know, he was a hardworking state senator. In Congress, he became a big supporter of the Trump agenda and of Trump. I, I don't think that sits well with New Yorkers. You know, when he was first out there running, it was when it was assumed that Andrew was running again. And, and I suspect the Republicans were expecting the, neg- the negativity of Andrew to give them an opportunity. And, you know, Long Island is often an overlooked but very important region politically. Which last, can go either way. Right? Well, I was going to say last yeah. November, yeah. it was a wipeout for Democrats, yeah. particularly Nassau County. I mean, we, we had really historic losses in Nassau. So it is it is it reemerged in November of 2021 as a Republican stronghold and opportunity. Now, keep in mind, Lee, Lee Zeldin has a primary also, you know, so we'll see what the petitioning will produce. But, you, you know, you know, Harry Wilson, I gather, is out there. Petition member Harry ran against Tom DiNapoli in 2010. I, I you remember, remember and Harry, spent a lot yeah. of money. And uh, Rob Astorino, who was Mm -hmm. uh, the nominee uh, in one of the races against uh, Cuomo. And then you have Giuliani's son. Whether they're all going to get on the ballot, I don't know. Is that Uh, Giuliani's son thing a joke or what? I don't think he thinks it's a joke. No, but do you think it's a joke? I don't see how it works. But that being said, with the Republican base, the Giuliani name is well known. But Giuliani, many people think, is on his way to prison. Uh, but if you're talking about prime Republican voters, the Trump motivated base, I don't think they feel alienated from Giuliani. But, you know, that being said, I, I, don't, I wouldn't if I was a betting person on Republican primaries, I wouldn't put my money there. But supposedly Harry Wilson was talking about spending some 12 million dollars that could have a big impact in a primary. But the Republican structure seems to be solidly behind Lee Zeldin. So, you know, I would guess he's the favorite today. But we'll see. Primaries. You know, in New York State, as you know, we're a closed primary system. You have to be in the party. So the party loyalist in this polarized environment will be making the choice. It's anybody's guess. But, but you know, I think Kathy Hochul on the D side is definitely the favorite. And uh, Lee Zeldin for now looks like he's uh, the favorite on the Republican side. Okay. Tom DiNapoli, I want to ask you some questions, but we only have five minutes left in this. So I want to ask you to keep these answers relatively short, which I know you always do probably in honor of the fact that both you and I are short. Uh, now, for, for, <laughs> former Governor Cuomo seems to be trying to make some kind of comeback or something. What do you think of that? I think it's going nowhere. I mean, what, whether, whether that really is what he's trying or, or just trying to rehabilitate the image. If he ran for office again, as some people are speculating, I, I don't think that would go too far. He'd have to collect signatures and do things like that. He would have to do that. And there's some talk maybe he'll run as an independent, not in a primary. I don't know. The only hope he would have is if, if Norman Adler is advising him, but I'm not sure you, that's you, happening. You bet. You bet. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about Trump. You know, uh, we had a number of people who are in a position to do something, whether they're district attorneys or other. How come, in your mind, how come nobody's really been able to lay a finger on this guy? Well, look, I mean, first of all, well, I've got to say the jury's still out. Maybe that's the wrong wrong way to answer it. But look, I think there's still a lot going on in terms of investigations. But look, if, you, if you're looking at the money side of things, it's very complex, layers and layers of, of financial dealings of the Trump organization. I can't begin to know how unraveling all of that, you know, what that leads to. You still have the January 6th commission. You know, maybe something comes out mm-hmm. of that. Uh but I also think anytime you're talking about a former president, it's tough. I mean, I, th- I think there's a lot of, of, of institutional inertia that makes it very hard, you know, to do that, right? Hmm. But I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I have not been involved in the Trump investigation, so, so I, Tom I, I DiNapoli, can't comment further on that. Tom DiNapoli, uh, Mr. Controller, to be more formal, marijuana in my good state of Massachusetts. We've been making a lot of money off of marijuana for a long time. New York said they were going to open up the marriage, but there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of progress. How come? Well, again, we're not directly involved in that. I mean, it's moving. I mean, it is making some progress. You'll, you'll see it. slowly, much it's like slow. a tortoise. Yeah. 
Well, you know, it's interesting. The other the other the other sin, you know, ga- gaming and gambling. Look how quick uh, New York went to the top of the list in terms of mobile sports betting and how much money we're making there. I don't love doing this stuff just for the sake of the money. Right. I think I think you need to evaluate some of the social consequences. I mean, obviously, society has moved way beyond but people uh, smoking marijuana. marijuana. No, I was going to say, well. They, they clearly are. <laughs> you, you don't have to walk too far in certain parts of the state to smell it without having to smoke it. But even on gaming, you know, there are a lot of people that they get addicted to the gaming. And, I, you know, one of the things we've said in our audits is that we're not spending enough money to help families that have someone who's addicted to gambling and ruining the, the, the household budget. So there are consequences, not just making money when we open up these opportunities that we need to be mindful of. So if we're going a little slow on implementing it, as long as we do it right, that to me is, I'm okay with that. I'll be talking to you about this in about 20 years. Let me, talk to, <laughs> let me talk to you about bail reform. The Democrats had a sort of whiplash on that one. People thought we might be letting people out too easily. And we only got a minute and 40 seconds. So what do you got? Well, I mean, I guess fortunately, because it's such a contentious issue, it's not a controller issue. So we haven't done an analysis of it. But I think the the challenge here is that there's there's so much heat and rhetoric uh, you don't really have the kind of thoughtful conversation on this issue that there needs to be. So, you know, it's so tied up in the politics of the legislative and the gubernatorial election this year. You know, right now it doesn't look like the proposals for amending the current law have a lot of life. But I think once the budget's done, as they go to close out the session, it'll be one of the discussions. How it will play out, you know, I don't know. Well, in any case, Tom DiNapoli, it is such a joy to have you here with us. I know we're not the New York Times, but you have been, <laughs> you have been showing up. You're not our, even the Great Barrington News. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so, WAMC is the best. And Alan, thanks to you and David and the entire team here. Ian, I've spoken to a few times. Through COVID, you have kept us informed. You have kept us going. And that's why I'm always proud to be on your station. And if I and if I can say so, I've been proud to support, you know, when when you needed that help. And I think all your listeners really have embraced the mission of WAMC and rightfully so. You you call it like it is and you give us just thoughtful information and the fun shows that you have on AMC as well. This is a treasure. And thanks to you, this treasure continues. And I'm going to make a promo out of that very thing and play it every 60 seconds. Tom DiNapoli, we love you. Thank you so much for being with us. State Controller Tom DiNapoli. The Capital Connection is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262. That's 1-800-323-9262. Or visit us online anytime at wamc.org, or you can even schedule a podcast. And join us again next week at this same time for another political conversation with Alan Chartalk. I'm your producer, David Gustina. Thanks for listening. 